my name is Morris Green. Uh, I was born in Astle, what used to be Avery's Portage, uh, New Brunswick, which is five miles east, uh, west of uh, Boys Town, in uh, 1942. And uh, I've lived on the Miramichi my whole life. My first memory of the Miramichi in particular, I was three years old at the time, and I remember going on a family picnic at the mouth of Burntland Brook, where it joins the Miramichi. And I remember walking along the shore and looking at the river and looking at the brook. <clears throat> and there were some people there from Fredericton that day. And uh, I was talking to this, this old gentleman who was walking along the river, and I was sort of impressed by him. He looked to be pretty old, and I asked him how old he was, and he told me he was 95. And I never forgot that. And uh, so we had quite, a, quite an interesting chat. He loved the river, and uh, his family brought him out there that day as a treat. And I, I remember that very distinctly because he, he was really an impressive uh, person. Well, when you look around the world and, and uh, <laughs> listen to the world news uh, every day, uh, one of the things that a lot of people are looking for is, is some sort of uh, retreat, uh, a safe place. Uh, and when you get a safe place that's combined with the beauty of the water and the forests and the clean air and, and you know, clean sky and, and uh, friendly people and so on, it, it really makes it an appealing, uh, uh, I think, destination for many, many people. And it's been that way for, you know, hundreds of years, really. And uh, the other thing I'd say about the Miramichi that's, that's interesting, although it's never been known as one of the economic hotspots of the province, people here have always had to work hard, struggle to make a living. There's always been that element of hope uh, among the people that things are going to get better, if not for them, perhaps for their children or grandchildren. And I think that's the same thing that brought the original settlers here from, you know, wherever, whether it be Ireland, Scotland, England, uh, you know, the Netherlands, wherever, France, they came here looking for something better than what they had at home. And so I think that feeling is still prevalent and strong here. The other thing about the Miramichi that I like is a sense of community, uh, where people have a long history of helping one another through difficult times. And that's been here since the days of the early settlers, and it's still here today. And, um, you know, and so that, that's, those are pretty special uh, traits, I think, for any community to have that sense of uh, collective responsibility for one another. One of the things in, in my life is that I've taken the time to learn about uh, settlement here from the very beginning, uh, European settlement and <laughs> Aboriginal settlement in, in as much as anybody knows about it. So a Miramichi way of life is something that's always been geared to, to the outdoors, to the, to the resources, uh, to the fish in the river, uh, the seasonal the cycles of the fish coming up. Spring uh, for us, the beginning of the new year actually for us was the going of the ice in the spring. And then the, uh, the fish that followed, whether it be the, the black salmon or the, uh, the arrival of the gasparo, and the sea trout always came with the gasparo. And then the uh, trout up into the brooks. And as children, my brothers and I in particular uh, were uh, fanatical trout fishers and uh, very proficient ones as well. And uh, so that, that was sort of the mar beginning, really, of our new year. It wasn't January 1st, but that was the beginning of the, of the new year because we were so closely connected to nature and, and uh, what it produced for our, for our benefit. <clears throat> it's sort of an interesting thing to realize that General George Patton, uh, the great American general, used to wear a 45 strapped on his hip and led the Battle of the Bulge, once spent a winter uh, with William H. Griffin of Cross Creek on, on Griffin's trap line. And uh, anyway, uh, and when he left, he presented William H. with uh, a beautiful custom-made rifle. And Bill Griffin, who lives in Boystown now, who was a great-great-grandson of William H., uh, has a, this portrait of, his, of William H. with the rifle across the knee, and the rifle is still in the family. It belongs to one of the descendants in uh, Halifax. So that's, that's just one little anecdote suggesting that, you know, the people who came through here uh, and, you know, we've had presidents and princes and, and so on uh, come here, royalty, uh, 
You've had business magnates uh, uh, and, and so on who've, who've come here as well. And because they're, they were attracted by the same qualities that, that the people who lived here loved. Well, if you lived in a, in a city like New York or, or London or someplace like that where it's hot and it's crowded and uh, the pace of life is frantic, I mean, the expressions like New York minutes and so on are, are quite appropriate and so on. And you had a chance to come away here with a total change of pace, a total disconnect from those things which normally occupy your day. And uh, just to sit back and relax and, and, and to reflect, I think that would be appealing to anybody who could, who could afford it. I think it's changed uh, dramatically, not only in my lifetime, I'll go back to uh, the beginning, back to the uh, construction of the railroad between Fredericton and, and uh, Chatham in the beginning. Uh, the Gibson Snowball Line, uh, the Northern and Western Railroad it was called. But uh, that railroad opened this whole area up uh, to easier access uh, for people from outside. It also brought a number of other people in. It generated uh, communities like Joketown, for example, and Blackville and Boystown uh, that sort of gathered as, as a hub for the economic activity of that particular uh, time. So the railroad was the first thing, and then the highways, and the change of transportation with uh, automobiles and so on, that certainly uh, made a big change. And then, of course, there were the changes in the economic uh, activity like forestry, where we had mechanization uh, that came in first in the form of a power saw and then skidders and, uh, and then harvesters that gradually took people out of the woods. When I was a young fellow, uh, if, uh, when you, if you wanted a job and you couldn't, didn't have anything else, you could pick up a buck saw and, a, and an axe and a spud and go to the woods and, and uh, make a living. And those days are, are long gone. And uh, so that's, that's changed. The other thing that's changed uh, dramatically, too, is that uh, the number of children in, uh, in families it used to be that some families, I, I know there's one family across the river where there were 16 children in, in one family, and now you'd almost have to go to 16 houses to get 16 children, if you were lucky. And so the demographics have changed tremendously, too, <clears throat> which brings me to another point. And that is one of the things that made the Miramichi attractive to a lot of people early on, uh, is that there was a whole section of young, fairly well-to-do people who were looking for adventure and challenge. And uh, the wilderness of New Brunswick, the Miramichi in particular, offered that, that opportunity fairly close at hand. And that's why you had people like Barnwell Roosevelt, who was Teddy Roosevelt's uncle, who came here in the 1850s to fish from Burnt Hill uh, down to uh, Bloomfield Ridge or Campbell Settlement as it was known. And uh, they were outfitted at the time by William Wilson, who was a brother to the guy whose family founded Wilson's fishing camp up here in, in uh, McNamee. And, and so uh, it, it's, it's been here for a long time. You know. Mercy way of life has changed a great deal. I, I remember as a boy, Men were still going to the woods in the winter to cut logs, okay, and that they were gone for months at a time. And uh, as you know, within a few years, it wasn't long until people uh, were going away and coming home on the weekends because there was transportation and roads to to bring them there, roads in the woods, and and so that that aspect of a Miramichi way of life changed. Uh, the other thing that changed is that uh, outfitters were becoming, along the river, outfitters were getting more organized. And uh, there was a great influx of uh, uh, sports from the United States, from Europe uh, in particular, who, who came here to, uh, to enjoy the, uh, the advantages of, of the river and so on. There was a large cadre of people in St. John and Fredericton who saw the Miramichi as their playground. And uh, so they would come here uh, from St. John. They would come up uh, sometimes uh, in the early days by a uh, paddle wheeler. And later days when the railroad was built, they come up by a railway. And uh, they'd be met in Fredericton by uh, William Wilson, perhaps, uh, with uh, a truck wagon, load all their luggage on and, 
he'd transport them over to, uh, to the Miramichi where they would be canoed up river and dug out canoes up to Burnt Hill where they would stay for maybe a week, two weeks, three weeks, even a month. And uh, it was this group from St. John that actually in, in 1874 purchased uh, Burnt Hill uh, from uh, the University of Nova Scotia Land Company that had, been, had bought 589,000 acres in uh, 1834 as part of a land settlement program. And uh, anyway, the land settlement program didn't work out that well, but forestry uh, certainly was a lucrative part of that business. And uh, in latter years, they realized they had a fortune in the fishing rights. And so they, they sold 1,000 acres at Burnt Hill in 1874. And three, uh, five years before that, uh, 200 acres at Clearwater had been sold to a, a, a former uh, army lieutenant uh, from, who had served in Fredericton. And um, anyway, uh, Lieutenant Swinney was his name. But anyway, and at the same time, uh, they bought, somebody bought uh, 50 acres at the mouth of Gilman Brook and the same group. And so there was actually a fishing club on the upper Miramichi River that started in, eight, well, 1874. It, it became more formalized in 1876. And um, anyway, and they were dedicated to fishing on the Miramichi. And they would come there and spend a month at a time. Uh, fishing, and there were local guides employed and cooks and so on. 1874 was a particularly good year where one man caught 802 pounds of salmon in a matter of 21 days. And uh, anyway, he was, he was pretty proud of that. And he kept a diary which is in the uh, New Brunswick Museum in St. John, and uh, which is kind of a, an interesting historic document. I think this lifestyle that we have this way of life, this connection to the land and the water, I think is, is, is something that is a, uh, I think, a reminder uh, to others of perhaps what the world should be like. And I think that people who have that connection tend to be a little more reflective and uh, a little more considered in the way they look at the rest of the world. I think it gives them perspective. And uh, I think we have some people in the world today who could use some perspective. This way of life has produced some absolutely incredible cultural uh, offshoots. For example, there's a whole range of storytelling that has been connected to this river all up and down for the river for years. And those stories tell more than, than you know, maybe a funny or quirky line. They actually are a pretty good reflection of the people and how they thought when they were coming, when they came here. And, and as time went on. And uh, so that, that's part of it. Another part is music. Uh, it may sound uh, uh, sort of corny to people from outside who like opera and Mozart and that sort of thing, but the, some of these people, like Abe Munn, for example, or Abe Moon, who, by the way, worked for Joe Jefferson, who had the camp at, across from Clearwater in 1886. He had three moons working for him. He had Abe Moon, uh, he had a grandfather, the father, and the, and the grandson. And so he referred to, to them as the full, the half, and the new moon, because they were also known as moons as well as muns. And, uh, but Abe Moon was known in his day, or Abe Mun was known in his day, as a balladeer. He wrote songs uh, about things that happened on this river. And uh, I have a copy of one uh, there called the Dungarvan Hooper, his version of it. And uh, anyway, the first line of it goes, the sports are coming to Charles Green, so they say. And because Charles Green was my great-grandfather. And he was in the outfitting business as well as being a carpenter. And he also operated a sawmill. And uh, he was a justice of the peace and did quite a number of things in his life. And, uh, but anyway, uh, so it produced music, it produced stories, some poetry, and it produced I think a pride in self that uh, the settlers who were coming here as desperate people, separate, you know, strangers to one another, built this tapestry of interconnectedness over the years. And so I, I think that's all part of it. So that, that's why it's valuable and that's why it's worth preserving. The Atlantic salmon is important to the Miramichi way of life. 
because in the beginning it was a major food source for the original settlers and it was one of the reasons why they chose to live next to the river and why river front properties were important. And if you look at the 1861 census uh, for uh, the upper part of the river, Hayesville, Campbell Settlement as it was called and so on, you will see that uh, the occupations of different people are listed as farmer fishermen because they had licenses in some cases to uh, net uh, salmon, so many barrels of salmon, so many barrels of Gasparo. Those were the two species of fish. And uh, Maxwell Green, who was the original Green in our family who came here, had a license to, uh, to uh, net eight barrels of Gasparo. He had no salmon. I suspect he probably took some anyway, but uh, that was his official license. And others had you know, a mixture of the two and, and so on. So salmon was important for food, okay? And as times changed and uh, it became important as a sport fish, it became an economic generator for the outfitting business and, and so on and all that's connected to it. The guides, the cooks, you know, uh, transportation uh, guys, the, the whole, the whole uh, ball of wax. And so the salmon was important then, as, as I said, for, for the economics, for jobs. And uh, <clears throat> why it's important today is because of it, not only its historical importance to this river, but it's important as a species in and of itself. Because uh, I know different times I've spoken about the Atlantic salmon as being the canary in the coal mine. And uh, the fact is that the aboriginals knew that everything on this earth is interconnected one to the other. And if we lose one thing, like people are all concerned now about the right whale, right whales being killed. Well, the salmon is much in much the same uh, category. And if we see the Atlantic salmon disappear from this river, not because of dams and the pollution the way they did in the St. John, but because we have failed, we collectively as a human race have failed to protect them, whether it's in the feeding grounds off Greenland or on transit back and forth or in the river itself, then we failed. And it inevitably is a signal that uh, with their demise, you know, it's a, a suggestion that our demise is probably coming along as well. So uh, in a sense, it's, it's, it's a failure on our part to, uh, to protect those, those valuable species. Well, salmon angling has always been important to the Miramichi with a decline of numbers and with a change in regulations in the last number of years. It's, it's had a substantial negative impact on, you know, on the economy of this area. Uh, guys like Jerry Doak with his fishing tackle shop down here, or Sid Matchett, or, or you know, uh, Jeff Curtis and Blackville, whoever is running that kind of a business today um, is, is suffering uh, because there are fewer people fishing, uh, there are fewer sports coming to the river, and, and so on. <clears throat> the other thing that's really concerning to me is that with the long connection between the local people and taking a fish out of the river to eat, uh, being broken by regulations and by this, the, the need for conservation, some of that linkage is being broken. And the connection that was once there, that close visceral connection is, is being lost. And I'm afraid that um, if once it's lost, then the local people could conceivably be detached uh, from the fish and not worry about it the way they used to. I, I can tell you that uh, when, when I really started seriously fishing salmon in the early 70s, uh, the river was full of fish because the federal government had finally done something to get some nets out of the river to let the fish come up to spawn. And uh, I remember standing with a group of people up at Nelson Hollow where I was fishing at the time uh, with the Haley lions in particular, because Haley practically guided me that summer to introduce me to salmon fishing. And uh, we looked across the river at Kelly Channel and you could see the salmon porpoising over there as they came, the huge run of salmon coming up the river. And, and I'd never seen anything like it before and I've never seen anything like it since. And it was, it was incredible. It, it was sort of like, and everybody had a fishing rod in his hand 
and was headed to the river. Everybody wanted to get down there and, and to fish. And in those days, you could keep, you know, salmon and grilts. And uh, so I, I've seen those days, and I've seen other days when, uh, you know, you couldn't find a salmon except in the cold water pools like Big Old Brook or, or someplace like that. And the other thing that's changed in the river, too, uh, in terms of that, is that the local people who own fishing rights have started to use them as economic generators, which means that other people who don't have them have less access to the river than they once had. Uh, after I moved from the Nelson Hollow area down to the center part of the village, I used to fish right down here at uh, Art Mitchell's. And Art had a nice pool, and, and uh, Art and I knew one another, and he told me, he said, you can come in there and fish anytime. He was a night watchman down at Russell and Swim at the time, and when he came out there to fish, I would pack up and go. I wouldn't fish while he was there. There were other people who didn't. And I saw one day he had to take his boat over to the other side of the river and fish off the island because there wasn't room on his own shore. So uh, I think courtesy along the river was, was important then. It still is. Next door was a fellow named Tom Sturgeon. Now, Tom was uh, an irascible kind of character, and he... Uh, he was very possessive about his particular stretch of water. It was a good run. I didn't know Tom, <clears throat> excuse me, at the time, but uh, when I was fishing at Arch one day, I saw this fellow come down the river with a salmon on, and nobody, there are guys there sitting along the shore fishing, nobody offered to help him. Anyway, I went out after he tired the fish and asked if he'd like me to net it for him. He kind of looked at me, and I said, sure, and so I netted the fish, and Anyway, he took a salmon back up the shore. Anyway, a little while later, he came down with a, with a grill on, and I netted that for him. And uh, so then he introduced himself, and we sat down and talked a while. And he told me, he said, anytime you want to fish my water, he said, you just go right ahead. You come up here anytime, and you're welcome to fish in my pool. I never did, but, you know, but he made the offer. So that, that sort of, to me, was, is the Miramichi way of life. Uh, that used to exist and, and so on. But as I said, when people started making money off their water, and you can't blame them, they didn't want other people coming in and, and taking fish that their sports might get or whatever. And so that sort of changed things around. When I was minister back in uh, 1990, I had the idea of, of uh, taking all these what I called orphan pieces of crown land that were... Uh, uh, disassociated with the large blocks of crown land, just individual blocks, 100 acres, 200 acres here or there. And my idea was we identified them all, and my idea was to auction them off and to take that money and to use it to buy waterfront for the public so that people would have more access to fishing water, to take away, first of all, any conflict between the local people and, you know, outfitters or Americans who might own fishing water and so on. So anyway, the plan worked beautifully. We sold a lot of land for a lot of money. I mean, more, more than a lot of the lots were worth at the time. But unfortunately, by then, I had left government, and the money went into general revenue. It never was used for what it was intended to buy those fishing waters because somebody else was in charge. And uh, it wasn't me. Had I been there, that's what the money would have been used for because that was the purpose of the whole program. It wasn't to sell off land. It was to generate income to buy good fishing water so everybody would have a chance to go on and fish if they chose. Well, tourism, <clears throat> there are different kinds of tourism today, of course, uh, far different. It's not, people don't just come here to uh, fish for salmon anymore. They come here to kayak or canoe the river. Uh, they come here to uh, go out into, into the, uh, on, onto the river and to... Uh, um, you know, bird watch or, or just, you know, go for nature hikes and that sort of thing. And some people have become entranced with uh, William F. Ganong, who, who spent his summers for something like 50 years traveling this whole province and studying uh, what he found. And he brought other professors with him from his university in the States to, to uh, go on these tracks too. And uh, so, but a lot of people like doing that sort of thing now. They like to retrace trace those steps. Other people are, ha, are reconstructing the uh, portages between and among the various New Brunswick rivers that the Abor aboriginals used to use. And so some people are following those paths with their kayaks and canoes as well. 
And so there's, there's a whole host of reasons why people come here. But why it's important is because anytime some people come to an area, they need to be fed, to be housed, and transported. And uh, so those, those particular industries benefit financially uh, from, you know, from that sort of influx of uh, tourists. Well, I think there are fewer anglers. Um, and one of the reasons why is because a lot of the fishing waters have been consolidated under uh, particular ownerships. And that means that those particular uh, waters are only available to the guests of that particular owner. So that's one reason uh, why. The other thing is that there's a generational change uh, as well among the people who, pardon me, once came here. The children of the original uh, sportsmen who came here to fish don't necessarily fish anymore. They may fish for bass instead of salmon, for example. They may choose to go duck hunting in Georgia or somewhere uh, and so on. They may travel to Iceland or Norway or Scotland or some other place to fish or to New Zealand or Patagonia or somewhere like that. And so uh, they have far more choices today with, with transportation being the way it is and, and so on. So there, there are a lot of reasons why we don't have as many of those people. But we have an increase in others, in other types of, uh, of tourists. And that's what we really have to do. We have to create uh, centers that are going to appeal to a wider range of people. Take, for example, the collection we've been gifted uh, in this museum. It's, uh, it's a whole collection of memorabilia and artifacts connected to fly fishing, but it also has works in it, sculptures and, and paintings and prints and so on that have aesthetic value in and of themselves, but that, which would be appeal, appealing to people who, who love art. And so it has a, a, a two-dimensional attraction uh, as opposed to perhaps what we had before. Things have changed a lot uh, from the beginning of the MSA in 1953, and things have changed a lot in terms of government uh, since the early 1900s. At one time, the provincial government was deeply involved in promoting tourism of the river and of the forest, hunting and so on. And, uh, but in later years, I, I don't find that they have quite the same, well, things, things have really changed. It used to be that promotion came through appearances at sportsman shows that were held largely through New England. Uh, Harry Allen from Pennyac went as far as Kalamazoo, Michigan uh, to promote uh, his hunting and fishing business uh, on the Canes River. Uh, the Allens pretty much had the Canes River to themselves for a number of years through government lease. And in the early days, they also had a hunting territory around the Rocky Brook area. But after a while, they abandoned that, and they basically focused on the Keynes River. But Harry Allen was the man who really started that. So th those, those times, have, times have really changed in, in, uh, in terms of what people are looking for and the people who are coming and, and those kinds of things. Now, the, the background noise that we heard here a while ago are from the children who attend the Come Play in Our School River uh, program that we have, have an educational program, their summer camp where families come and stay in a trailer park or in cottages or whatever while their children, grandchildren, are attending the school. And the school is very popular and uh, very well attended. And uh, I have never met anybody who, who went away dissatisfied with you know, the exposure their children have gotten. And these children are learning about the river and learning about fishing and learning about canoeing. And perhaps that's one of the ways that we can use to stimulate the numbers for the future as well. Well, the river is, uh, is organic. It's, and, and although it may not have, the water may not have life in and of itself, it contains life. And the land through which it runs is ever changing. And uh, islands shift downstream over the years and, and uh, channels change and fishing spots change and, uh, and that sort of thing. Uh, the other thing that's changed a great deal too are the forestry practices along the river. Uh, where there's been a fair amount of uh, large-scale clear-cutting. And, uh, you know, there are buffer strips along the river to try and keep it cooler and, and so on. But I, I really think that 
that the whole water system has to be taken into account. Clayton Stewart writes in his book, uh, Life in the Miramichi, that there's a spring near McKeel Lake in the upper part of the river that is so cold it will freeze butter. And that stream comes down, McKeel Brook comes down into the Miramichi, and Greg would be familiar with that area. And uh, that helps cool the water. Well, there are many such streams along the river like that, many springs. They should be protected to maintain that, that uh, temperature, to keep the water cold. Salmon is a cold water fish. And if we can't keep this water, the river cold, fish will die, you know. Every year, restigouche, the restigouche, they go along with big canoes and garbage cans in them, and they have five-gallon garbage cans, and they pick up dead salmon and uh, take them away. Either that or the eagles eat them, dying from warm water, frunculosis, that, the disease that, that uh, is triggered by those warm temperatures. But we have to do that. And we have to maximize the cold water opportunities along this river. And we did that at one point. When I was minister, another thing we did, we had something like 400 people employed through the summer months that, that dedicated themselves to a whole number of things. Some people were doing things like tree thinning. But we had others dedicated to enhancing the uh, salmon habitat on rivers by narrowing uh, brook entrances to the river instead of letting it spread out and warm the water. Uh, we were taking out beaver dams so that salmon could get up into these brooks and spawn uh, where they used to and to increase the flow of cold water into the river. So we did a lot of things like that. We even raised the layer or the uh, level of lakes uh, and uh, absolutely incredible group of people who we had employed, none of whom, by the way, had ever done that sort of work before. But they learned on the job and they were dedicated. I was, in the, in the fall of 1988, I took a, a bus of uh, reporters around the province and we went around and visited a number of these sites uh, where this work was taking place and it was fantastic. And, and uh, the work that these people did, as I say, the dedication they had. We weren't paying them an awful lot of money to do the work, but boy, they, they, certainly, they, they, they certainly punched above the weight of what we were paying them. They gave us a greater return than we, we actually paid them. 1979, New Brunswick established its first fish barrier uh, as a holding place for salmon when they came up a particular stream uh, in order to protect it from the fish from poachers. Yeah. Because what used to happen when the fish went up there, the upper part of the stream, poachers come in and clean them out. So while I was minister, we established one of those uh, barriers on the Tobik. We also did one on the Northwest Miramichi. And there's another tale. The Northwest Miramichi River was wiped out twice, once in the 1960s and once in the 1980s by a toxic spill from the heat steel mines. And the whole river was obliterated. And it was so bad, they actually had to bring in rocks and larvae from other streams to sort of regenerate, if you like, the, uh, the flow there. Edward Weeks, who was a member of the Miramichi Fish and Game Club, actually wrote a book uh, in which he recounts those two incidents uh, because the water flows by their camps and, and so on. And that, that particular camp was started, I think, by Michael Adams and his group in 1880, if my memory serves me right. Yeah. The other thing I want to mention, there's, there's a mine at Burnt Hill, a tungsten mine, okay? And there's a holding pond sitting up there in the hill that has water in it, okay? And every now and then, it's going to overflow down over the bank into the, into the river, okay? And the thing is, <clears throat> the mine that was there uh, was first developed during World War I because uh, Canada needed tungsten. And they, that was one of the few places where tungsten existed. And so they operated a mine there until about 1917 uh, when it was closed down. It was reopened again. They looked at it in World War II, didn't do anything. But in the 50s, they started doing some more work up there. And uh, here, just a couple of years ago, they were in there again. They were taught, thinking about reopening that mine. And uh, after what happened with Heasteel Mines and what happened in British Columbia with that huge earthen dam giving out there uh, and all that contaminated waste coming down in there, I, I th think it's something that people would look at with great reservation today far more than they did then. People didn't have the same concern about the river then 
as they do now. And they didn't understand the interconnectedness of things. I can tell you this too, as a matter of history. In 1823, the governor of New Brunswick stated in his speech to the Legislative Assembly that it was their policy to blast the rocks out of the river all the way along in order to make a path for scows. And they had towpaths along the shore. Well, that started in 1823, and they were still doing it in 1860. Henry Swim was the commissioner in charge of that. And he has a report, I have a copy of it at home, uh, where he talks about working all the way from Burnt Hill down to uh, uh, Quarryville, where they were blasting rocks out of the river. They had dredges. They had these big uh, slush buckets, they were used to call. They were a two-handled outfit that people used to tow with teams to dig cellars in the old days. Well, they put them out on the sandbars and dug them out to make a trench. They increased the water depth between Blackville and Doaktown to 15 inches, and they actually brought a, a paddle wheeler right up to Doaktown, carrying freight and so on from downriver. But that's how they looked at the river in those days. They saw no connection between blasting rocks and taking out uh, gravel bars and sandbars and uh, salmon population. They just figured the salmon would go on forever. I, th I think they can recover if everybody works together. I made a presentation to the House of Commons Fisheries Committee on May 19th of last year, and one of the points that I made to them is that I think that Fisheries and Oceans has to get engaged like it was back in the early 70s, uh, when we had a minister there who in six months did more for salmon conservation in this country than any other minister we've ever had before or since. And, uh, and what, I, what I asked them to do was to set up a task force within the Department of Fisheries and Oceans with an, a dedicated assistant deputy minister who had nothing else to do except to uh, put that group together to look at all the aspects of salmon fishing. One of the things, for example, just a small thing, gather all these studies that have been done over the years and, and, and collate them in order to gather that information and turn it into uh, into analytical, analyzed data, as opposed to raw data that's sitting there going to waste. The other thing that really shocked me, and, 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 and uh, under the, uh, the previous government, the federal government, they had a policy of actually destroying libraries in fisheries and oceans offices across this country. They, I think they destroyed 16 of them across this country in a matter of two years. Scientists were out there dumpster diving, trying to save records that were 150 years old, reports that have been written, you know, uh, 150 years ago. Well, fortunately, this government has reversed that policy and, and so on and stopped that, that type of destruction. And they actually do have a good attitude towards salmon. And there was a fairly decent report that came out of the, uh, the fisheries committee. It, they didn't accept my particular proposal, but at the same time, they, they have become active in the, uh, in the, on the salmon file. The minister is hosting a meeting in Shippigan, I think, or in Shediac at the end of the month, uh, involving all the fisheries ministers from the salmon producing countries uh, in, in uh, Europe and North America. And uh, hopefully they're going to be moving towards some sort of a, uh, a joint action. But yes, it can be done with leadership. The other thing that, the reason the federal government should be involved they have the constitutional authority, and they can bring in the important groups like uh, the Miramichi Salmon Association, the Atlantic Salmon Federation, all these river management groups, and all these other conservation groups that have resources and the willingness to get involved to make this thing happen. And I have an idea, I actually put it in, in, in my last book, and that is that when you look at people talk about the fishermen in Greenland, and how they're taking our fish. They're taking fish off their water to put food on their table. Most of the fishing in Greenland is subsistence fishing. You know, a good deal of it is. And so if we're going to ask them to surrender a food source, we're going to have to give them an alternative. And I think the solution, quite frankly, is land-based salmon aquaculture. If they had land-based salmon aquaculture, they could produce food not only for themselves, but they can produce that whole range of products from smoke to candied salmon, salmon pate, the whole business, all the way through with a nice landic stamp on it. 
And people would buy that because of the symbolism of it, but also because it would be a good product. I think the same thing should be done on First Nations and get the nets out of the river and, and get them involved in that because it would create economic activity in the same way. I also think it's the sort of thing that began because the world uh, market for uh, salmon in particular is, is practically unlimited. We could do that in rural areas, like along here. We could get people here involved in that. We've got to get those fish, those salmon, out of the nets off the, in the, in the, near the mouths of streams because they, they breed disease. They, 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 uh, they introduce all kinds of uh, negative elements like antibiotics and so on when they escape from those particular pens and so on. And it's pretty well an established fact that wherever that type of fishery exists, the wild salmon populations are, are typically decimated. They've had that experience in Norway and Scotland and, uh, and, and now they're talking about huge scale development off the south coast of Newfoundland. Same thing's going to happen there. And we've got it down in the Bay of Fundy and I'm sure that was a contributor to the demise of the Atlantic salmon in the St. John River and the Salmon River and, and the Little Salmon River and all those tributaries, the pet, even the Petakodiak that once held uh, you know, large numbers of Atlantic salmon. When I was minister, I, I was afforded the opportunity of working not only with people like Jack Fennedy and, and, and company and the MSA, and they were fantastic. I've, New Brunswick has never had a spokesman for salmon like Jack Fennedy. He was beholding to nobody but the salmon. He didn't have any corporate ties, nothing. And, and when he spoke, it was for the salmon. And he was an eloquent uh, person as well, an absolutely incredible uh, mind and, and, and vision and courage. I, I, was, I was a great respecter of, of him. And, and another one uh, was Herbie Wade. I, I thought the world of Herbie Wade. He was, he was important. Uh, Eldred Bailey was another one. Uh, Clayton Stewart, uh, Preston Griffin. Those, those to me were, were giants in the, in the area conservation movement. Uh, in, uh, along this river. But the other thing I wanted to say when I was minister, I, I worked with the MSA uh, as well, and, and they were wise counselors. And I think that's a good term. We, we need wise counselors. Greg was saying that, and he's right. But the other thing is I worked with First Nations. At the time, uh, there was a great deal of netting going on at the Mactaquac Dam uh, by Kingsclear First Nation. And uh, I opened dialogue with them and I asked them if they'd be interested in getting into the outfitting business. And they were. And so uh, we entered this, this agreement where uh, the province would secure either a lease or uh, ownership of the riparian waters below the Mactaquac Dam that had been taken away from the owners back in, when the dam was built in the mid 60s. And uh, they would get a chance to generate some revenue for this property that had been just basically expropriated without compensation, and, uh, and so on. The other thing I did, I had a dinner down in St. Andrews one morning with Tom Sifton, who was the minister, federal minister of fisheries at the time, explained the plan to him and asked him if they would contribute 50% of the cost, and they did, just that's how we get through that one, no problem. So that's what we did, and we gathered the water for them, and then eventually uh, they built a motel up there as accommodations for the guests. And they get into the outfitting business for quite a, quite a while. Chief Sokovi was, uh, was in charge at the time. And I remember that he was so fervent about uh, protecting those salmon for the outfitting business that he charged his brother for netting fish, caught him at night, and uh, had him charged. And, and he was fined and whatever penalty was attached to it. We also opened negotiations at the same time with Red Bank, uh, or Metapanagiog as it's now known, uh, eel ground, um, the idea of setting up uh, an outfitting lodge there. They've done that subsequently. They do have a, an outfitting lodge, but that's, that was the genesis of it. We also opened negotiations with uh, the natives at Cross Point. And when I went in there, that was a flashpoint. I, you people are all too young, except maybe for Greg to remember. But that particular summer, uh, the natives uh, at Cross Point had firebombed, a, uh, thrown a Molotov cocktail onto a uh, Department of Natural Resources uh, boat that went in to take a net out of the river and they had attached it to a, uh, an engine block and when they were pulling it in like this and pulled the boat close to shore, 
and th they threw a Molotov cocktail into the, uh, into the boat. So uh, uh, relations between the natives and, and the department in the province were pretty tense at that time. Well, I, I went up and met with them and mediated, and uh, the idea was to get them into an outfitting lodge further up the rest of Gouche, so they would stop netting uh, down river and allow the fish to get up again. And uh, <clears throat> anyway, all of those things were in the works when I retired in 91, and uh, anyway, and nobody else followed through on them. But um, the foundation had been there. As I said, Red Bank ended up building their own outfitting lodge, but nothing was ever done with, with the other ones. But I do think that the same opportunity exists now that existed then, and that is some initiative that somebody else may want to pursue. Well, I actually <clears throat> fished, I've fished a fair amount. I haven't guided that much. I did a couple of times because uh, Raish Murray, who was the uh, head of the ranger station down here, contacted me in 1974 and he asked me if I'd guide this Dr. Coinway, who was the former head of the World Health Organization. And uh, so I said to him, well, I've never really guided anybody before. Why don't you hire somebody who knows what he's doing? And he said, well, truthfully, there's no one else. So I agreed to do it. So I, I, she, he was staying at uh, Maxime Wyckoff's camp in, in Blissfield. Maxime Wyckoff, I'm sure you probably have never heard of her, but she was married to John Atherton, who wrote The Fly and the Fish. Okay? He was an artist, and uh, some of his work is downstairs as part of that collection. Uh, I showed you uh, those two pictures from South Africa. Yes. That salmon in the middle, that was, that's John Atherton. And there's another one further over. But anyway, she had the camp, and, and, and uh, Dr. Coimway was her friend. So I went down and guided him for a week, and that was an interesting experience. He had only trout fished before. And we had a huge rain that year, I remember, and the water came up five feet overnight. <laughs> and the fishing on the Miramichi was wiped out. The water was pretty high anyway. So I took him back to Dungarv, and we caught some grilts back there. And, uh, but then as the water came down at the end of the week, we came back, we were fishing down there at Halfway Bar. And I remember Saturday night before he left, he hooked into a big salmon. I say big, 12, 15 pound salmon. And it was dark and it was raining. And uh, we should really have gone home. But he hooked this salmon. And so I took him down, the salmon took him down a long ways. I got him in the canoe and I pulled him down the shore. and We went across Bogans and this sort of thing. And uh, at the last of it, he tired the fish, and I said, I, I think I can, I can get it. And I told him to bring it in and, you know, get the head headed for the net. And when he did, I, I saw the fish cl cl or, uh, cross the aluminum frame of the net and saw the head go over. And when it did, I netted it like that. So anyway, I got the fish for him. Brought it in, and sure, you'd think that he was given a million dollars. He was all excited, and he came over, and he started to hug me. I said, yeah, I'm glad you're happy, but I, we don't do that sort of thing around here, if you don't mind, and, and I'll shake hands with you and stuff. But anyway, that's okay. Uh, but he, he was from France, he was, and he was very emotional, okay? And the other thing, he was from France, and he, he knew everything. Like he, he, and it's funny that he would even need a guide, because he, I remember we were down at Donnelly Brook fishing, and we came to this old bridge, and we were driving his car, and he had, he had a Volvo, a nice car, and uh, anyway, he was going to go across the bridge, and I said, I think you should check that bridge first. And he said, no, he said, that'll go over that. And I said, no, I don't think so. So I get out and looked at it, and I came back and said, no, nah. I said, we should walk from here. And uh, he said, no, he said, we'll drive over it. And I said, okay. So he drove out onto the bridge, and boom, both front wheels right down through the bridge. And I turned, looked at him, and I said, so what are you going to do now? He said, well, I saw a big pulp truck back there a couple of miles. He said, why don't you walk back and get it to tow us out? I said, I don't think so. <laughs> I said, I think we can get us out. I said, do you have a jack? Oh, yes, I got a jack. So anyway, I jacked the thing up and took some of the broken boards and put it under the wheels and backed the car out of there and so on. And I said, now, I said, you've learned a lesson. I said, there's still some things you have to learn yet. If you're going to fish on this river, and one of them is to listen to somebody who might know a little more than you do. But anyway, but he came back the next year. I guided him again. And uh, he brought me a big box of Cuban cigars, of all things. And, uh, but anyway, that year I decided I didn't really want to guide, so I introduced him to Ralph Jolts in Blissfield. 
Ralph had a little outfitting business, and I took him out there and let him fish Ralph's water one day. And, and uh, after that, I, Ralph, he came to Ralph's every year. He used to drop in and visit, but uh, anyway, that was... And then we had a group of five young fellows from northern uh, New York State who came here one time. They worked in an assembly plant down there. They had no money or anything, but they wanted to try salmon fishing. So Stan Donovan down here and myself got together with them, and we took them out to Nelson Hollow up there, and we fished, and they, one of them hooked a fish. They were so excited. It was, they were like kids. And, and that was part of the joy of, of, you know, of guiding them, you know, especially somebody who had never done that sort of thing before. And uh, until the last couple of years, I've gotten a Christmas card from uh, the guy who was the head of the group. He was the foreman in the factory. Every year he'd send me a Christmas card. We exchanged cards. I think he passed away. But uh, so those are a couple of experiences I had guiding. How do you spell it off his name? Uh, C O I G N E Y, Coin. I, and that may not be entire. I have it in a book at home. I have a notebook at home. But anyway, but he, he claimed, he was an interesting guy to talk to. He claimed that he was the one who carried the message from the Germans to the Allies that they wanted to surrender in World War II, you know. And uh, anyway, he, he was a pretty interesting guy. He was married to a former showgirl from uh, a dancer from uh, Ziegfeld Follies in New York. She was with him. She was doing cooking. Big, tall girl and, uh, you know, beautiful, beautiful lady and, and a very nice person. But I enjoyed, I enjoyed that part of it. And, uh, but I enjoyed Maxine Wyckoff, too, because she gave me some instruction on, on how to put together uh, a bamboo fishing rod so that it would come apart, it would stay together, but come apart easily. And she had a pain. She had a, a pain fishing rod that, that she w we were using as a, a beautiful, beautiful thing. If we don't know our history, we don't know who we are, and we don't know where we're going. That's one of the reasons why I always had a great interest in history from the time I was a, a little kid. I was always full of questions about things. And uh, obviously, we, we have to know who we are. And that's the problem with a lot of people today. They don't know who they are. And they keep trying to find themselves. Well, you find yourself by knowing your family and your background and the other families and so on. And I think of the Miramichi now. Merlin Palmer, who, who runs, I call him Palmer. Uh, up, up here, we, we, we're calling, we call him Palmer, because that's the name, they, the way they pronounced it when they came from London, 1834. But Merlin is a cousin of mine. Mervyn Green is a cousin of mine. Uh, Freddie Green, who used to be the ranger in Boys Town, a cousin of mine. And all the families here are on my father's side are connected, you know, over the years through marriage and so on. And so it's important to know those things, important to know what those people did. And uh, so that's one reason why I, I like to write. And uh, I put a lot of this material into, into the two books that I've, I've written so far. I lost another book uh, here a couple of weeks ago, 75 or 100 pages I had in the computer, and I deleted it, and I can't get it back. It's gone. And, but anyway, I'll, uh, in what that book consisted of were stories. I mentioned the stories earlier. I have probably 150 pages of uh, Miramichi stories that I've gathered over the years. And I remember stories that people tell me. I can remember stories. That's when I wrote my first book. I put stories in there that people had told me back in 1978 uh, because they're important and I remember them. So. People, uh, kids today who uh, don't feel grounded, they don't feel they have roots in something, it's because they don't know who they are and where they've come from. And they don't appreciate what other people have done to make the way for them today. I, I think it's a great project. And again, it's, it's because it's, it's gathering those things that are too soon forgotten. Like I mentioned, Joe Jefferson, you know, people don't, <clears throat> you know, people don't know about him. They, they don't know about, Abe Moon and his, his, his poetry. And, and uh, you know, Abe Moon, I think, wrote the last verse of the folk song, Duffy's Hotel. You must know of Duffy's Hotel. If you're looking for fun and enjoyment and you want to go out on a spree, come along with me over to Boys Town on the banks of the Miramichi. And, uh, but anyway, uh, and then there are other songs along the Miramichi as well, like Peter Amberley, uh, you know, the Messenger Song. 
uh, is another one written by John Calhoun. And the sad thing about John Calhoun, because some people started changing his poems, his songs, and Mervyn Green told me this about a week ago. He said that uh, John, in his old age, got so disgusted with people changing his songs around that he took all the ones that he had written down to, and threw them into the stove and burned them. Well, if, if you'd like a step back in time to when people were connected to the land and the river, this would be a great chance to do it. The other thing is it's not an individual thing, although fishing is, but it's something that all the family can enjoy in one way or another. This museum encapsulates much of that history of people's lives who have done that before you and expressed it in painting and sculpture and fly tying in broad buildings and even making fishing reels and that sort of thing. And so coming here to this museum is a good stepping off place for you to make your way out into the Miramichi and enjoy your greater vacation. There are quite a number of waterfalls actually. Uh, Fallbrook Falls is the one that gets, but there's also Troutbrook Falls. And uh, anyway, my dad took one of my brothers and I up there salmon fishing one time. We tented at Green Flats, which is where Maxwell Green homesteaded uh, in the 1860s. Uh, and uh, anyway, we, we went up to Troutbrook Falls, and we went to Fallbrook Falls while we were there, and uh, it was a great experience. I, I love that. New Brunswick is blessed in having so many species readily available, the species like black bears uh, and moose and deer uh, and partridge, uh, you know, uh, rough grouse we call them, or, or uh, also, uh, you know, we have spruce partridge, we have different, different species of birds like that. We have all kinds of uh, ducks and geese and so on too that are native here in the, in the summer. And a tremendous number of, of other species of birds uh, that, that migrate here and spend the summers here, including hummingbirds. Merlin Palmer's uh, theaters are an interesting place to watch hummingbirds. I, I was there one day and I watched, he must have had 24 hummingbirds around one feeder and they were lined up, it looked like McDonald's. They were lined up in queues at the four portals, waiting their turn, uh, you know, flying while, while they're waiting to feed. And one would feed and take off, another one move up. It was kind of like the gas shortage back in the 70s, and people were filling their cars with gas. But an incredible thing, you know, to, to watch, or quite, quite, a, quite a thing to witness. But the variety of, uh, of colors that we have. It's interesting that they talk about Ireland having, what, 32 shades of green? I'm sure the Miramichi has as many or more. And we have certain viewpoints, like the top of Price Hill up here in Ludlow. I never cease to be amazed by that, that view from the top of the hill. Or down here in Blissfield, there was another one where you could see the bend in the river, and I'm not sure if it's visible anymore or not, but there are places like that. Uh, I'll tell you another great place is uh, at Big Murphy, where Wilsons have their camp up there. That, that uh, dining room they have, uh, and the, the view from that, that river is fantastic. But uh, no, the Mary she has a lot, of, a lot of great beauty. And beauty is good for the soul. Truth is beauty and beauty is truth, you know, as, as the poet said, and, and, and it's true. Uh, and I, I think that, I think it, it, it does something to people's nature, their character. And I think a lot of people could, could use, could benefit from a week or two of that type of recreation. Well, they're going to see a, a wide variety of, of hues and shades of bright red uh, to, to yellows to ambers. Uh, and and you know, you're going to see species like <clears throat> the uh, mountain ash with a burgundy uh, color. And that's going to be interspersed with the evergreens that you know, provide a tremendous contrast uh, to those as well. And as you drive along or, or canoe along, uh, uh, and, and view these things, it, it, it's, it's a kaleidoscope of, of uh, sensual enjoyment is what it is. I was born and brought up here, and, and you know, you don't often appreciate what you have until you've gone somewhere else and come back. And there's never been a time when I've been away from here that I haven't felt excited and, and happy at being back here, not just because I was coming home, but because the whole river is home. And, and, and the province isn't that far behind. We had the occasion to drive down to 
Penfield here a while ago, and even driving down through uh, along the St. John and all those beautiful rounded hills down there, you know, in that part of the country. And when I was young, I had the fortune of, I've walked a good part of this province uh, for different reasons. One, one particular job I had one summer, we started our work day at Morrissey Rock. I don't know if you know Morrissey Rock or not, up near Camelton. And we went up, our first job was to go over the top of Morrissey Rock for three weeks uh, running every morning. That's where we started our day. And because we were doing surveys in those days, the provincial government used to hire people to go out and do surveys. Another summer I spent walking uh, Charlotte County. And uh, we were doing, I was working for Mines Branch. And I remember chuckling to myself when I was being interviewed for the job. I remember the fellow's name was Smith. He was a, an assistant deputy minister. And he said to me, he said, this is a tough job. He said, this is out in the woods. There are flies out there. He said, I don't think you'll last in the woods. And I said, well, give me a try. I, th I think I might be OK. I was brought up in the woods. And when I was a kid, 12 years old or so, I went into the woods where I worked there every summer in the woods until I graduated from high school. And the last thing my brother and I did before we left home, we cut a carload of pulp for my father, cut and peeled it. And uh, anyway, that was kind of a parting gift for him. And uh, so I, I know the woods, and I know what it is to work in the woods. And uh, I know how people here earn their living. And uh, that's, uh, I guess, that's one reason why when I was in politics, I worked the way I did for them because I knew what it, I knew who they were and I knew what they needed 